Welcome back to the show. Glad to be back again. We were all virtual for so long. Now it's time to get back in person. Hacker Valley on the Road is a curated collection of conversations that we've had during conferences and events around the globe. In this collection, we'll be sharing the most surprising moments from each conference that might change your work in cybersecurity. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Hacker Valley Studio podcast. I am so glad to be back again here doing something different, a podcast from Melbourne, Australia. We just did ASA CyberCon, and now we've decided, you know what, let's have some of the people at the conference sharing the experience join us on the podcast. Today we have with us Adam Green, cybersecurity executive, and also Dirk Hodson, uh, cybersecurity director, both at NTT. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Absolutely. So let's start off with sharing a bit about who both of you are. I know that, you know, we met about a week ago. The team at Exonius was so excited to have you on. They said that you all are great partners. You share a lot of experience industry experts. So let's start with you, Adam. Tell us a bit about your background and what are you doing today? Yeah, so I've been in the industry for well, about two decades now and, and I've focused most of my industry experience on the disruptive side of technology. So that's obviously led me through to cybersecurity and obviously everything cyber these days. It's a bit of a catch-all phrase for everything. But, um, but yeah, now working with NTT, we focus very much on um, how we provide our clients with greater insights into what their threat landscape looks like and trying to get them to think more in the mind of a hacker so mm. that we can we can then work it backwards from there but we don't just we don't just look at what's currently happening today it's looking much more future focused and uh, and then offering protections that way love that helping everybody protect themselves let's kick it over to you dirt absolutely Ron. And like adam i've been, been around for probably a, a little while in this industry i actually started my my first career in military intelligence with the Australian Air Force. And from there, moving into technology, it was kind of natural to gravitate towards cybersecurity, which now I've been doing for a while and look after one of the cybersecurity teams here at NTT. And just picking up and building on what Adam said, you know, we try to build a team that has a bit of everything in it. We've got people like Adam who are great with the offensive disruptive side of cybersecurity. We've got people who really focus in on architectures, We've got some great technologists as well. And then, you know, my job and where I try to, to uh, position myself is to be the person that kind of brings it all together for the customers to make sure that, as you said, we're, we're helping to keep them safe and that we're kind of on their team to protect them from the bad guys out there. Yep. So I, I got to say, when Adam, we met, <laughs> on the Zoom and now in person, there was someone that you look like and everyone at the company was saying that this guy looks like someone that seen in a movie and the person is Chris Hemsworth. And you were just telling us before we hit record that someone at the conference came up to you and said, hey, what are you doing here? I didn't know that you were given a keynote at the conference. <laughs> and that's hilarious because you guys do kind of look alike. But tell us a bit about what the conference experience has been like for you so far. Yeah, it's been great to over 4,000 delegates. Uh, it's been a whirlwind of uh, two and a half days. Many, many you know, really good client conversations. Uh, it was a little bit of a, a rock star entrance to start with, I think, because <laughs> we'd all been in this lockdown phase for so long that um, it was like you're walking through and you're seeing people you haven't seen for nearly four years in some cases and and uh, and reconnecting those networks that we used to we used to do this stuff quite regularly. So right. uh, it it felt like going back home again. Uh, and you know we're in Melbourne. I I moved up from Melbourne to Brisbane uh, about three and a half, nearly four years ago now. So um, yeah, so it was like a coming home party for me to start with. But <laughs> but the business aspect side of it, there's been some great conversations and and definitely reconnecting those networks. It's been it's been great. Um, and then obviously the uh, the after hours networking's yeah. also been 
robust. <laughs> <laughs> and that's something that you don't really get to appreciate until it's gone. Being back in person, a lot of people will say, oh, it's about the talks. It's about the keynote. But like you're saying, it's really about the lobby con. It's about the things that happen around the conference because you might meet someone that you didn't intend to meet. Like there's a lot of people that we want to see and watch uh, giving the talks. But, you know, what about all the delegates, all of the people that help organize the conference? I also heard there was a lot of students here as well, learning, volunteering. And I think it's really magical to see all of that come together. Dirk, we miss you. We wish you were here in person with us. But, you know, we're still going to be sharing some of that information back to the world. That's why we're doing the podcast. But Dirk, from your perspective, what is something that you hope Adam brings back to you not being able to join the conference? Look, it's, it's a local conference, so I can't say duty-free or anything like that. But, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I reckon that the most important part of these conferences are those those little hallway hallway chats and really the connections that you would just never otherwise make. Um, but I am going to pick up on something you said there, Ron, about the, the keynote speeches as well. You know, a lot of the time in, in our industry, we tend to get very task-focused, right? There's a particular cyber problem at hand that we need to solve. So all of our conversations end up being about that problem at hand. What I think these conferences are are so good at is giving people a chance to just get outside of their their daily box a little bit and perhaps turn up to a a talk that they wouldn't have ever otherwise thought to research or or attend or or listen to. And, you know, maybe they learn something or make a connection in their mind that helps us to grow that cyber body of knowledge. Yep. You know, I was actually really nervous to come here. I was nervous for a few reasons. One, I was given a talk. It was titled Cover Your SaaS, Managing Misconfiguration, Shadow Users, and Excessive Spending. And I was telling some of my team members, hey, I'm giving this talk. And they were like, ah, I don't know if the Australian audience would respond well to it because a lot of financial institutions are on-prem, a lot of big organizations, logistic companies are still on-prem. And they were like, Ron, Australians do it differently. And going to some of the talks, I started to realize that there are some differences. And one of the things that I was really impressed with is how we in Australia, the focus on the business, providing business outcomes, identifying business requirements. Adam, for you, you know, working with so many organizations, how do you consider the Australian audience, the Australian cybersecurity practitioners to be different than the rest of the world? Yeah, so I think there's definitely been a big maturity shift in the Australian market, especially over the last, let's say, three years. I think that cyber threat landscape has really evolved quite rapidly. If you think back to when we started in the industry, your cyber threat cycle or the the disruption cycle was a matter of years. We'd say, say like three years and you start to review what you were doing around back then. We called it network security. Right. But then we've seen a lot of high profile breaches and those high profile breaches have become more and more regular and then more sophisticated and in some cases not so sophisticated. So we've noticed that the Australian market has definitely moved in time with the rest of the world now. Uh, look back three years ago, we used to say we we're about five years behind the rest of the world. <laughs> uh, so I think I think that education has happened quite rapidly. We've understood, you know, we, used, we used to think because of proximity to the rest of the world, we're pretty safe. And that's in that you know, the kinetic warfare terms, yeah, yeah. We're, we're pretty isolated. But uh, it's it's definitely become a lot more of a professional approach to security and and you've got you've got people with greater understanding. They do their own research. So when we're coming in and speaking with clients now, we're not we're not there to teach them about cybersecurity the same way we used to. Now it's more about, well, how do we help you achieve those business outcomes? Right. And it's a lot more of a, an interesting conversation now because we're not going in doing 101. Uh, so, so I think, yes, Australians do it different, but we're also pretty good at being early adopters. So, uh, so I think your speech would have been very well taken because anything that's going on anywhere around the world these days, the Australians are, are looking at it and going, how can we be first to market with these things? So, right. so it's a great, great melting pot of, of new technology and, and leading edge thinking now. Right. Uh, Dirk, anything you would add to that? Yeah, a few things. I mean, look, I think that generally speaking, Australia as a market really loves to try to be you know, the first in the world or the best in the world. And we also love to find innovative and different ways to do things. Um, I used to spend a lot of my time in and around the defence industry and it was you know, it was well documented via a number of government reviews that 
most arms of the Australian Defence Force, which really are kind of a microcosm of, of our society in a lot of ways, had this, um, you know, just do it, let's find a way, let's make a way kind of culture, which can be a good thing and can be a bad thing. It means that you you get the outcome, but perhaps you cut some corners along the way. Um, I think that really what's happened over the past couple of years with some of the exceptionally high-profile breaches that, that Adam, Adam talked about there has kind of made us, um, you know, almost not necessarily catch up with some of those workarounds that perhaps we've done over the years, but it's made us as, a, as an industry look really closely at everything across the board that we've been doing and going, okay, we're, we're leading in these areas, but what about these other areas? Let's bring them up to, to where they need to be. And as a result, there's been this really rapid modernisation and, you know, I think that's going to continue for, for some time as, as we see the threat landscape continue to worsen as such. Um, but also, you know, we're probably going to find some new and different ways to do things, which is pretty exciting as well. You know, I'm glad that you brought up, you know, some of these topics because in the United States, one uh, framework that a lot of practitioners look at is CMMC, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. And when I was at the conference this week, a lot of people were talking about the essential eight, the essential eight this, the essential eight that. It was almost like everything was around it. And when I did my research, it actually was very similar to CMMC and a few other frameworks. Uh, what trends are both of you two seeing? Like, what are, what are your focus areas right now? Because the world has just evolved, especially through the pandemic. Yep. Uh, Dirk, what have been some things that you're focusing on today? And what are some of those trends? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, just picking up on the essential eight point that you raised there, Ron. Now, I think that's a great example of, of Australian innovation. And really where that came from was the Australian Signals Directorate doing a quite, a, quite detailed research into how they could help to protect government and, and um, whole of economy systems from, from the bad guys, essentially. And what they worked out very early on was just doing a few things exceptionally well meant you were protected from 85 plus percent of all of the potential attacks out there. And you know, when I say well researched, they actually really went to a lot of effort to look at what was happening around the world, but also to actively test those, those controls using some of their own capabilities within their, their own organisation. And as a result, it's it's pretty robust and it's something that the, the economy has really picked up on well. And now the Cyber Security Centre is really promoting well and we're seeing a lot of people um, ask a lot of questions about that. But they're not questions about what is it. The questions are really how can we go and get to maturity level four? How can we make ourselves the best in the world against this framework that we certainly a lot of people see as world leading in that sense uh, the other big trends that I'd, I'd talk about is, you know, we've obviously still got the work from home piece and the work from anywhere yep. piece, which is is absolutely continuing out there. I've seen a lot more people ask questions about, you know, hey, what happens in an incident and how can we get better prepared for an incident? Whereas maybe in the past they were thinking more about the how do we stop the incident piece. There's more of that recognition that sooner or later, um, you know, resilience means that sooner or later something may happen, we don't want it to happen, we try to stop it from happening, but if it does happen, we're able to respond and recover really, really quickly. So I'm, I'm seeing the market a lot of movement towards keeping doing what we're doing well around the prevention and, and detection, but also really growing that resilience piece and, and getting the response and recovery happening well. Resilience is everything. And, you know, that was one of the things that we were speaking about a few weeks ago when we first met uh, Adam. And you you mentioned that you did incident response for years and you you worked on some 20 plus really high profile security incidents. What was that like? Tell me, you know, a story. What, what stood out? I mean, yeah. 20 incidents. It must have been many years over the course if it was major incidents. And you've probably seen a lot of different types of attacks, different situations. Yeah, absolutely. So, so my role in those incidents was was very much a fly on the wall. Um, so coming in at an advisory layer, not not hands on tools, not doing any actual forensic investigation, but more someone who's looking from the outside in to understand what could be done different. And one thing that was one thing I can tell you across all of those incidents is you've got commonalities. So I, I always have my three golden rules, and the three golden rules are: first of all, you you don't disconnect from the internet because if it's a particularly malicious attack, you've got to be mindful of um, anything that's 
placed in what we call a red button or you know the the potential for an absolute obliteration of all of your hardware so of the of the drives so so we say don't disconnect if you if you can avoid it mm. um, and then from that you start to consider well that device has already been hit so let's use that to learn what we can so then roll, golden rule number two isolate what's being owned and let it like let that be your forensic tool let you you start to learn from that and rule number three is if you can avoid it, you don't pay the ransomware. So, <laughs> uh, but, but if we look at those 20 attacks, so one thing that was common was rule number one generally got broken. Um, in a lot of cases, they ran along and they pulled out the cord and right. uh, disconnected the internet. Um, rule number two about isolating what was already owned, generally we didn't see that done very well. Uh, and rule number three about paying the ransom, uh, um, in most cases there was there was anecdotally some ransom paid or negotiated. But what we see across all of those attacks is in every case, they had the right technology in place. Mm. I mean, look, it's 2022. We've all acquired a lot of cybersecurity technology. But what wasn't done well and why those attacks actually occurred is because they hadn't done the the basic things right, the basic hygiene things right. So right. Um, they hadn't they hadn't patched the latest version of endpoint protection that they had, but if they had have done that, that endpoint protection would have been good enough to pick up what was coming in from the from the start. In every case, they had something for email filtering, but it was in passive mode. So if they had have applied that compensating control the way that it was intended, probably wouldn't have happened. In every case, they had state-of-the-art, next-generation firewalls. But they hadn't reviewed the latest rule sets, which is something that we advocate quite heavily when we speak with our clients is do regular um, rule reviews right. on your firewalls because if that's your your, you know, your last line of defense or your first line of defense, depending on how you look at it, you want to make sure that you're up to date with how fast your business is moving, not oh, let's review it every three years or even better, copy and paste the rules when we change from vendor A to vendor B. So, so then we see that they didn't they didn't apply the same compensating controls that they know they should be applying. And then, you know, another thing that we see every time is they had the best outsourced security operations center that they thought they could get, but again, it's outsourced. So, when we see something's outsourced, there's you need to have someone on the inside who can respond to the outsourcer, and in every case. There was there was no interface between the outsource and inside for for a rapid response once something was seen or as we say when the balloon went up. So you learn a lot from being in those rooms. The other thing that was very common was they were learning or writing up their incident response plans on the fly. Right now, what we have noticed in the last eighteen months because of so many high profile breaches is that incident response plans used to be rare and. People spoke about them potentially, and they may have them. And you know, generally they were in a, an electronic format. So if you get owned, you can't reach the uh, can't reach the incident response plan sometimes. But we have seen a big push in maturity towards actually getting incident response plans in place. So now our conversations aren't so much about have you got an incident response plan. Our conversations are more about well, how can we help you to update and modernize and test under live fire those incident response plans and continually reiterate and continually improve them. So let's break that down a bit further. You mentioned the three steps. I love the three steps, but I'm curious as to the first step and why that is. Don't unplug. What is the consequence? What have you seen when someone does unplug after a breach? Yeah, so so once they unplug, you stop, you stop getting all of that rich telemetry and, and the rich information that could continue to flow. Um, luckily in the, in the rooms that I've been in, we haven't seen the red button situation where it just liquefies the hard drives. However, uh, in, you know, in working with, uh, forensic investigations responders and working with, uh, some of the world's best ethical hackers and slightly unethical hackers, um, <laughs> we, you know, we know of instances where an unplug meant that the red button activates because, and what we say by a red button is, it's a constant handshake request from the command and control. Mm -hmm. And it's it's doing that. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? The moment it doesn't get for a certain period of time, it doesn't get its handshake back. It says time to liquefy the hard drive. So in that instance, you'll never recover 
the data. And if it's a particularly malicious attack and the intention was absolute chaos and disruption, then you're not going to get that information back. And, and restoring from that point, very, very difficult. So that's why we say don't unplug. One, for the red button, and two, for the continual forensic capability. Uh, but you know, I think um, when you realize you're under attack, human nature and muscle memory says, let's go unplug what's being owned. Right. Sometimes you can't help yourself. I mean, I would want to do the same thing, especially if I didn't have any cybersecurity experience. If I saw that my workstation, my laptop was doing something weird, first thing I'm going to do is close it up. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it sounds like that might not be the base, best case and probably not, especially because that means the attacker is watching your move. And what I love about you two is it seems like you all are a dynamic duo. Like there is some synergy here. You guys light up when you guys talk <laughs> to each other. I want to hear more about like you two's relationship. How do you work together? What is, you know, your role as the director and then you as the executive? How do you all ping pong off of each other and work together? Do you want to take that one, Turk, or do you want me? <laughs> Well, mate, mate um, I'll, t I'll say all sorts of great stuff about you, shall I? Um, no, look, it's, it's great question, Rob. And, you know, I think I'd probably bring that one back to saying you know, cybersecurity is the ultimate team sport yeah. in a lot of ways. Adam's got a lot of great experience in, in those war rooms that you've both just been, been talking about. My experiences are a little bit different. And we've got other folk on the team who have very different experiences again, you know. As one example there, um, Adam was talking about uh, firewall migrations and, you know, the fact that quite often when you move from vendor A to vendor B, one of the initial things that a lot of projects look at is go, all right, let's just pick up the old rule sets and migrate them like for like to begin with. Or you can say the same about a lot of endpoint protection suites, application whitelisting suites and the like. And, you know, at the end of the day, what we like to do, and I think the thing that our whole team brings out is, is that bit of a, you know, viewpoint of, okay, well, let's think forward from that. All right, sure, we'll do the, the lift and shift initially. Maybe that's the lowest risk way to do it. But if we if we move forward three months, six months, 12 months, or even three years, what are the things that could go wrong if we don't actually go down the road of mitigating for the latest, greatest threats, but also the biggest risks to our organization. So, you know, I tend to find that Adam's the, the person on the team who's great at that scenario planning piece and going, hey, here are the things that are going to go wrong. Whereas, say, myself and a couple of the other people on the team look at that and go, okay, cool, what's that going to cost the organization for one? What's the actual consequence in a risk management sense? And, and therefore, you know, what's the reasonable budget and the options to implement a, a solution or a set of controls to make sure that that risk is um, either never realised or if it is realised, we can mitigate the scale of that consequence through uh, some other form of control framework. So, you know, it's kind of, you say dynamic duo, I think it's a bit yin and yang as well. I think it's just about <laughs> all those skills and making sure we use them. So that was a really um, professional response. I was going to say we, <laughs> we both love craft beer and fine whiskey and Ooh. that's how we work really well together. <laughs> also true. <laughs> <laughs> and you look at our, you look at our backgrounds and, you know, similar backgrounds, but, but as Dirk said, yin and yang. Um, and you look at how we, uh, our personal lives, there's a lot of uh, synergies in our personal lives. In fact, the, the way that Dirk and I got together working together was I used to work at a competitor and I was, so I was Dirk's direct competitor. And, uh, and one day there's the yin and yang right there. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and I was, I kept coming across this Dirk Hodgson in the market and, and I couldn't compete because he had this 500,000 pound gorilla behind him. And I'm just this little, uh, consulting practice that was local. And, uh, and one day I went, oh, I think I should, I think I should have a coffee with Dirk. So, you know, we did the five minute little small talk and we're, yeah, we, we we have a lot in common, so that five minute small talk went real fast. But mm. but Dirk, being an ex military man, he's got uh, he's got a certain way about him, and he just went right. So what are we doing here? And uh, <laughs> and then we I, we had a conversation about the way we both operate, and we found that we have very complementary ways of operating together. So we decided let's join forces and. Uh, and I think I've, I've heard quite a few times that uh, out in the industry, we are referred to as the dynamic duo, yeah. and especially when we go present on stage together at conferences and you know, we, we go out in front of clients together. But as Dirk said, it's a team sport. It's not, it's not just Adam and Dirk. Like we, we're fantastic when it's us and the other 15 in our team and, 
and clients just really feed off that passion that our entire team has. Yeah, I, I love the analogy of team and team is everything. Like we can't do things alone and we've tried it in the past, especially in cybersecurity. We tried this one man show idea and it can get you somewhere, but it's not gonna get you robust. It's not gonna get you diversity on your team and other types of thought. Uh, what we always like to say on the podcast is cybersecurity practitioners are mental athletes with no off season. We're constantly chasing the threat, having to evolve and and adjust. But I think what it, when you boil it down, a lot of it comes down to communication. And I love what you were saying about Dirk. He he's put his fist on the table and said, "What are we doing here?" <laughs> but I think it's also important to have the ability to have some of that small talk. I see some teams they want to like really live in the small talk and not really get to the meat of the matter quickly enough and that yeah. will kill a lot of time in meetings and then you know maybe there's not that person that's direct and getting that information from you so how would you all say communication works in cybersecurity what works well when are there breakdowns what has been your perspective i'll start with you adam yeah so i think when you walk in especially if it's a first conversation it's a very defensive position that comes across from the other side of the table. Right. So, so we have to establish credibility real fast. And um, and what we find is, especially in the geographies we work in, in Australia in particular, it's about not just the company, but you as an individual. Do you have my back? Or can I trust you? Mm -hmm. Or if I don't like you, will you at least mitigate my risk for me? So it's you have to establish that credibility real fast. And I think we have a great, especially when we do it together or we do it with other members of our team, Collectively, we have amazing experience and we've been involved in some really cool cyber projects or um, you know, really cool stuff we do on the side as part of our give back. And that gives us that credibility when we walk in the room. And we're really good, especially when it's Dirk and I together, we're really good at reading each other's cues and where we need to bail each other out. So right. we establish that credibility real fast. And then once you've done that, and that may be a bit of small talk, but it's always focused on how can we help you and your career and mitigate risk for you. Uh, and then once we've established that credibility, then we, we start to see the clients start to open up and, you know, we, we have some, we have some clients that, uh, that, that like to talk to us just because they know that we're pretty um, giving with our experience and knowledge. We have other clients that come and talk to us because we have a very strong brand and reputation behind us. And they know that we've got strong global delivery capability. So so it's it depends on the type of client. Yes, the small talk is always is always there. We generally save the small talk for once we've established the credibility and then we you know we figure out oh you drive a really big V8 Ute or what do you call 